Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this talk and Q&A with Holden Karnofsky. Um, so Holden's going to kick off with a talk, and then we'll do a Q&A. So if you could submit your questions via the Swapcard app, you open the app, you click into this session, you click Live Discussion, and go on the Questions tab and submit your questions. You can do that throughout the talk and during the Q&A. So to introduce Holden, uh, Holden sets the strategy for and oversees all long-termist cause selection, prioritization, and grant-making at Open Philanthropy, including their work on global catastrophic risks. He co-founded GiveWell in 2007 and began co-developing Open Philanthropy, initially called GiveWell Labs, in 2011. So please join me in welcoming Holden. everyone. All right, so I'm Holden. Um, I was going to talk mostly about sort of career endpoints for long-termism, so what, uh, what kind of specific things I think people could be doing to help what, uh, what I've called the most important century go well. Uh, first, I'm just going to give as much just the, the whole backdrop and the whole context for my career, how it's gone through the various parts of effective altruism and why I'm now focused on um, mostly AI and more generally, uh, you know, long-term as causes that could be relevant within our lifetimes. Um, so I'm going to start there, and that's going to be kind of standard stuff that I've talked about before, and then I'm going to talk about things I've been thinking about more recently, which is just more, more about tangible actions we can take. Um, so just starting off, my background, what I'm all about. Um, you know, I, uh, in 2007, I was working at a hedge fund and trying to give to charity, and this was before effective altruism had a name or anything like that, and I wanted to give to charity and do as much good as possible per dollar, and couldn't really find a website that would help me with that. So my uh, coworkers and I, well, especially Ellie Hassenfeld, who had been going through kind of the same thing, we left our jobs, we started GiveWell, uh, and we basically created a website that researchers which charities help people the most per dollar. And we were very focused on creating something that the general public could use, so we focused on charities that were kind of large, could absorb arbitrary amounts of donations, had kind of an understandable linear model, were evidence-based, we could talk about them on a website, be very clear where all of our numbers and estimates were coming from, and so therefore we hoped that you know, anyone who wanted to give, whether it was $100, $1,000, or much more, could just come to this website, understand our reasoning, understand what we were claiming, everything would be credible and they would give. Um, and so that was 2007 when we started GiveWell. And uh, GiveWell now you know, is an is a organization that tracks uh, over $100 million a year to the charities it recommends. And GiveWell has generally um, ended up recommending global health and development charities. So things like distributing bed nets or malarial treatment uh, to reduce the prevalence of malaria in Africa, uh, things like uh, deworming, so treating children for intestinal helmets in Africa and India. Um, and they generally are finding these charities that have these incredibly cost-effective, evidence-based ways of helping people uh, so that your dollar can go as far as possible. Then a few years into GiveWell, we met Carrie Tuna and Dustin Moskovitz. So Dustin is one of the co-founders of Facebook and also Asana. Um, and they were trying to decide how to give away their several billion dollar fortune to help people as much as possible. And in some ways, uh, there was a lot of overlap with what they wanted and what we wanted because we were all thinking about how to make money go really far. But in other ways, we felt that maybe a different product would be better suited to them because uh, as someone giving away that much, you have a lot of options that, a more, that, that an individual donor might not. You can hire your own staff. You can invest in building your own trust networks. You can often create or seed organizations or kind of change an organization's direction with a large grant. Um, so we started uh, what was then called GiveWell Labs, what's now called Open Philanthropy, and the idea, and that, that eventually spun off uh, in 2017, I believe. And the idea of Open Philanthropy is also to do as much good per dollar. It's just less, um, less into making sure things are evidence-backed that they can be explained on a website and things like that, um, and more into what we call hits-based giving. So the idea of hits-based giving is that you might make 10 grants and nine of them might fail embarrassingly, and then one of them might be such a big hit that it makes up for everything else. Um, when we started work on, the open, on open philanthropy, the first thing we did was kind of look at the history of philanthropy, and we asked, you know, 
does, does any of this ambitious philanthropy that these giant foundations do, has it ever had big successes? Or should we maybe just stick with what's tried and true and kind of felt that there, there have been some absolutely enormous successes for, uh, for big philanthropy? So the green revolution that is credited with lifting a billion people out of poverty um, and resulted in a Nobel Peace Prize for Norman Borlaug basically started with a foundation funding uh, agricultural productivity research in Mexico, which was just not something that was incredibly popular at the time or that a lot of people saw the potential in or that governments were funding, but they thought if they could make better crops uh, for poor countries, those could lead to a big boom in agricultural productivity, and that is what happened, and it, and it was really, I think, one of the great humanitarian developments of, our set, of the 20th century. Um, another philanthropy success story uh, is that there was a, a feminist uh, philanthropist, uh, Catherine McCormick, who funded the early research that would lead to the pill, the common oral contraceptive. And this, I think, was another thing that it was, it was controversial at the time. It wasn't going to get funded through the normal sources. So a lot of the reason I'm saying all this is because through open philanthropy and through working with Carrie and Dustin, I kind of moved from trying to find evidence-based, scalable charity to trying to go for hits-based giving, trying to find things that could be really off and could be really wild and weird, but also could be far ahead of their time and could be a big hit. Um, and so open philanthropy over the years uh, has done a number of things. We've, we work in a large number of cause areas. Um, we have, uh, you know, I, I believe we're the world's far largest funder of farm animal welfare. Uh, we funded corporate campaigns that have, uh, I think, resulted in, for example, a lot of grocers and fast food companies worldwide making pledges to treat animals better, such as having chickens in cage-free systems. Um, we have funded work on criminal justice reform. We've funded work on macroeconomic stabilization policy. Um, we funded work on biosecurity. We've, we've done a lot of things, and it's all based on this kind of idea, this system that we're looking for things that can have outsized impacts and things where your dollars can go very far. Um, and so uh, recently, or you know, a, a little bit into open philanthropy, uh, I started to really take seriously the hypothesis that one of the best things you could work on is events that could happen within our lifetimes, but that could matter for the whole world and for the whole state of civilization uh, for the rest of humanity's future. So an obvious example would be if you could reduce the risk of a pandemic that might, uh, might be much worse than COVID-19, it might be so bad that it could kind of bring down civilization entirely, if you could reduce that risk, um, that would be an enormous amount of good accomplished such that it could justify a lot of money spent. Um, and it'd be an enormous amount of good accomplished, A, because there's just a lot of people in the world and pandemics tend to spiral out of control. And so a bad enough pandemic could imaginably kill like the majority of people on earth. Um, and also because if a pandemic got big enough that it could bring civilization down entirely, then preventing it could mean that we've had an impact on like the entire future um, of humanity. So that's a hypothesis I encountered. And then a kind of sub hypothesis of that is that it's particularly important to be thinking about artificial intelligence and how that could influence humanity's entire future. Um, and you know, I saw this engagement, engaging with these ideas as part of my job uh, because I was looking for things that, that could be way out there but could be ahead of their time. Um, and I eventually wrote a series of blog posts called The Most Important Century, which if you haven't seen it, you can just Google Most Important Century, um, arguing that I, I think there is a really good chance and a really good argument that artificial intelligence is kind of something that could be happening, a, a powerful enough artificial intelligence could be coming in our lifetimes to change basically the whole future of humanity, um, such that if we, if we build it right and it's used well, we get one future, and if we don't and it's used poorly, we get another future, and those futures kind of last for a very long time. Um, so I'm gonna briefly make that case, but again, if it's something that you are finding a little uh, a little wild or want to learn more about you can google most important century and it's there in all kinds of formats there's a you know a couple podcasts where i go through the high points there's a summary there's also the whole kind of like 100 page ish series um the basic you know the basic underpinnings of it uh one is that the series talks about just how different the world would look if we had uh really advanced technology i don't think that's a 
a super surprise to anyone, but I do try to kind of spell out what like a particular imaginable technology that I call digital people could mean, how it could lead to a world that is uh, very, very different from this one and also kind of more robust than this one. So I think one of the impacts of technology over time is that people have more control over the environment and are less subject to kind of chaos and drift. And so in the limit, and certainly I think if we had this digital people technology, um, you could imagine a world that once, once the people in power decide how they want the world to be, that's just kind of how it stays forever. Um, if you're not subject to various natural forces, not subject to aging and death and things like that. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of opening, opening bit of the series is that we, it's imaginable we could reach a long run future that is very sci-fi, very wacky, um, and sort of stable across potentially billions of years, and also maybe across many stars in our galaxy that we could expand throughout space. Um, the next you know, point in the most important century series is that that long run future that a lot of people think of as maybe being 100,000 years from now or 10,000 years from now um, could come a lot faster than that. And one reason for that is that the right kind of AI could lead to a productivity explosion. And so here the, uh, the basics of the case are that if you look at economic history zoomed out, if you look at the rate at which the world has been, the world economy has been growing and the rate at which things have been changing in the world, um, you see that it, for most of history, has been accelerating, which means that each period is kind of faster than the previous period. And if you were to just kind of naively project that acceleration out, um, the conclusion you'd reach is that we reach infinite growth, infinite, um, an infinite size economy uh, this century. And the reason that I don't think we should expect that by default is because the accelerating trend did stop a couple hundred years ago. Um, and so when you look at the big picture of economic history, you see acceleration. When you look at the more recent picture, you don't see acceleration. You see kind of steady economic growth. And what, uh, what I think is a good candidate for what happened is basically that there's a, a feedback loop um, throughout most of history where people invent new technologies, the new technologies leads to more resources, more food, which can support a larger population. Then when you have a larger population, you have even more invention and new technologies. That leads to even more resources, and that leads to a larger population. So you get this feedback loop. And what happened a couple hundred years ago is that feedback loop stopped um, because basically people stopped having more kids when they had more resources. Um, today, people who are wealthier often just have fewer kids, and so the population growth just didn't keep up in a way that could keep that loop going. Uh, I'm not saying this is a good thing or a bad thing, I'm just saying it's what happened. And then if you imagine that we could use AI to automate the role of humans in every part of the economy, and especially in innovation, creation of new technologies, if you had AI that could itself do the work that humans do to create new technologies, you would get that feedback loop back. And what a standard economic model says is if you have that feedback loop back, you get this sort of accelerating uh, growth that goes to infinity um, pretty quickly. And so the idea is that if we were to develop AI that could automate the process of research itself, um, you could have just explosive growth in the rate of new technology, and that could lead us to a wacky sci-fi future a lot faster than people tend to imagine. Then another part of the series is that I argue that you know, this kind of AI that you can imagine that could automate research is not just hypothetical. Um, it's something that as far as the best guesses, at least I'm able to make, and they're not particularly great guesses, uh, looks more likely than not to be developed this century. Uh, a decent part of that argument is just that the field of AI is very young. And so uh, it's been maybe like 60 years so far that people have even been trying to build powerful AI systems. So to say that we might see it within the next 80 years is, is just, I think, from a starting point, maybe not that wild a claim. Um, if you look at the growth in effort and research and money and people in AI, it looks even more robust that like a majority of the effort that's ever been put into AI will probably be, the, will almost certainly be this century. Um, so that's like a starting point. And then we have other techniques for forecasting transformative AI, uh, including surveying experts on it and including sort of projecting out when we expect to see an AI model that is in some sense as big or as powerful as a human brain, um, how much that would cost when that's expected to be affordable. So 
that's, um, that's the argument. And so then you have this three-point argument in the, in the series that the future could be really wild, that we could get there faster than we think with the right kind of AI, and that the right kind of AI looks pretty likely to be developed this century. Um, the final point that the series talks about is that I think the, one of the best counter arguments to everything I'm saying is that maybe step by step it's fine, but the whole picture is just very wild. It's just very wacky to say, oh, here we are, and this century could be the century that we get this kind of productivity explosion, wild, stable future, and we make all these decisions that could potentially matter across our whole galaxy for billions of years. Um, and I think it is kind of a wild and wacky claim, but I argue in the series that there's already a lot of reasons to think that we live in a wild and wacky time that have nothing to do with AI and that are just pretty clear and obvious. Um, you know, one of, one of those reasons is just to look at like timelines of major events, like the development of brains or the development of certain technologies. And you can see the events just getting like closer and closer together. Uh, I think there's almost no way to make a timeline of major events in world history or creation of new technologies that doesn't give you the impression of this crazy acceleration right around the point where we are. Um, other points I make are that if you look at the history of economic growth, our current rate of economic growth is like extremely high and it's been accelerating for most of history and it is too high that it, to, uh, to go on like this for very much longer. And so something has to change in the, in the coming like at least few thousand years. Um, and so most ways you look at it, there's a lot of arguments that we live in a time that is very unusual. It could be that we're in this time of very high growth that then slows down. Um, it could be that we're in this time of acceleration that accelerates even more and then slows down even more. It could be that we're all about to go extinct, but there's not a lot of ways to imagine that the strange world we've lived in for the last couple hundred years, the rate of growth and the rate of technology we've seen, there's not a lot of ways to look at that and say, this is normal, this will last for a long time. Something has to change. Um, and so I basically argue in, in my series that any possible view you could have about the long run future is wild and wacky in some sense. Um, and so that's supposed to kind of lower the burden of proof for, the, for these claims about AI. So having written that, having thought about it, um, I personally have become more professionally focused on what's called long-termism, which is trying to uh, have an impact on things that could matter for humanity's whole future. And um, I have especially become interested in AI and AI risk. Um, this is largely a personal decision. A lot of this has to do with just like what I think my skills are. I like to work in very underdeveloped areas that are not getting enough attention. Um, I like to work in areas where there's kind of a lack of frameworks and a lack of clear stuff to do, which tends to make them very unpleasant for most people to work in. Um, so I do want to emphasize that I have made kind of a professional transition into focusing more and more on long-termist work and on AI, uh, but this is not the same as coming to believe that this work is the only stuff that matters, and that is not what I believe. Um, you know, I think... I think uh, my sort of system of ethics would be a topic for another time, uh, but I basically do not agree with arguments that, um, that because there's so many people in the future that that's, that that's overwhelmingly important compared to things we can do today. Uh, I still care a great deal about GiveWell. I'm still on the board. I still catch up with Ellie every week. Um, I'm still very engaged in a lot of the work Open Philanthropy does on non-long-termist stuff, although I have um, handed over leadership of that to Alexander Berger, who's now co-CEO. So I am now professionally focused mostly on long-termism and AI, um, but I do believe that this other work remains extremely important. I remain engaged with it, and I think it's great to go into, but it's not really going to be the focus of my talk because it's not where I'm currently focused, and because I think, frankly, that finding ways to be helpful on that work and finding careers you can do is a bit more straightforward and is a bit more easy um, than working on AI. So I think if you're, you know, if, if what you decide is that you want to work on farm animal welfare, I think that's a great cause. Uh, there's a lot of organizations doing amazing work. You can like try to get a job. It's nothing too complicated. Um, there's just tons of great stuff that needs more people to help. And I think that trying to work on something long-termist or AI safety uh, is a lot more disorienting and it can be a lot more unclear how to make steps with your career that are going to actually be helpful and how to get there. So that is going to be the focus of what I talk about. Um, so all of that that I've covered so far is, is pretty much uh, you know, stuff I've talked about before, stuff I've been thinking about for a long time. Now we get to the part that's a little bit more improvised, a little bit more new, stuff I've been thinking about recently. Um, 
you know, and it's, it's just me kind of thinking about what seem like the most valuable, tangible things people can do to help the most important century go well. Um, and, and, um, and to ensure kind of a positive future instead of a negative future or no, no future for humanity. Um, so this is gonna be just, I'm just gonna kick off with kind of an opinionated, not super justified, because I'm still, still working on fleshing all this stuff out, uh, list of things I think people can do that are like especially helpful and kind of top tier helpful with long-term goals. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, my general you know, non-evidence supported opinions of how to navigate an early career to get to one of these endpoints. Cause I, I don't really think that just because you'd like to be in a job eventually means that you should be shooting for that exact job right now. Um, and then we'll do Q and A for the rest of the time. And I think we have a fair amount of time for that. So um, yeah, first off the, the AI situation, you know, I think uh, one of the most important things to think about when you're thinking about how AI could transform the future uh, is what's called the AI alignment problem. And this is the idea that if we were to build sort of um, these very powerful AI systems that can do research of their own, um, at that point you're dealing with systems that may have enough capabilities that if they had kind of their own goals uh, that were not compatible with humans, you could imagine them kind of taking on all of humanity and winning. Um, that's something I've written about on my blog, Cold Takes. It's called AI Could Defeat All of Us Combined. Um, and the question is, could, should we be worried that if we develop very powerful AI systems, they will end up with their own goals and they will end up trying to take down humanity? Uh, my answer by default is yes, we should be worried. Uh, I think a lot of the reason I think that is because if you just look at how people are developing AI systems today and you kind of project that forward and assume that it works to create a very powerful system, um, that seems like the default conclusion you reach because we are training these systems via this sort of black box trial and error. So you have an AI system, uh, you sort of, it's sort of a very, very oversimplified way of thinking about things is that it tries something, it gets a thumbs up or a thumbs down from a human, it tries something, it gets a thumbs up or a thumbs down, repeat many, many times, it learns how to do what it's doing. And the question is, when you're rewarding certain behaviors, it's ambiguous what you're rewarding. Uh, you could be rewarding an AI for doing what you wanted. You could be rewarding an AI for fooling you into thinking you, it did what you wanted. Um, you could be rewarding an AI for some random thing that happens to be correlated with you giving a thumbs up and that once it has the power to do so, that's what it will be trying to maximize. The analogy there would be that uh, humans have generally been selected for reproductive fitness, having lots of kids and grandkids, but we've ended up kind of a lot of humans don't end up wanting to optimize for how many kids they have. They want to optimize for other stuff that may have been correlated with that at some point, like how much power they have or something. Um, and so this is something that's been written up in a recent uh, Less Wrong Alignment Forum post by my colleague, Ajay Akotra. Um, and it kind of explains that I think if you, if you just walk forward on today's AI development path, it looks to me like there's a really big risk by default that you get these AI systems that do have goals of their own that are not compatible with humans that are gonna try and take down humanity. And that seems really worth avoiding. Um, this is an important point to have a view on because the things you wanna do uh, with AI look very different depending on whether you think this is a big problem or a small problem. Uh, I think if you kind of assume that whatever AI system we build will work exactly as intended and do whatever the humans running it want it to do, then you might uh, start becoming concerned with primarily making sure that whoever builds the most powerful AI systems first is like people with good values or countries with good values. Um, and so you might be really interested in like rushing forward the development of AI as fast as possible, um, particularly if it's being developed by people you think are good, companies you think are good, countries you think are good. On the other hand, uh, if you think it's going to be potentially hard to avoid designing these AI systems in a way that they're safe for humans, uh, then you start to be interested more in coordination, cooperation, finding a way for everyone to proceed cautiously without racing each other. So I think this is a really crucial point in AI. Um, and so when I think about what people can do to help the most important century go well, um, one of the first things that come to mind, this won't be a surprise, is AI alignment research. This is research on how to design AI systems that will reliably behave as intended, um, even as they're kind of in a world that changes a lot from the state they were trained in. And um, 
You know, the AI alignment work, I think there's a couple things about it that are theoretically good. One is that you are hopefully actually just reducing this risk. You're reducing the risk of AI systems that want to take down or want or try or optimize to take down humanity entirely. Um, but the other thing you might be doing, and it depends on the research you're doing, is you might be getting more clarity on how big the problem is. So I think in a perfect world, we would, be, we would have like experiments, experiments with AI systems that gave us some idea of how likely this is to be a problem. It's currently a big point of debate. Um, I think that's hard to do, but I think in many ways, the alignment research I'd be most excited about would be alignment research that gives us information and creates more agreement about how likely um, a sort of AI takeover risk is rather than research that is just trying to reduce that risk, although I think both are really valuable. Um, so, uh, you know, another, another comment about AI alignment research, even though I think it's very important and very exciting, is like a really young, underdeveloped field. Um, I think in general, it can be very hard to tell which alignment research seems like pretty likely to be super useful versus just like barking up the wrong tree. Um, I do think that a lot of alignment research today is not really pointed at the most important problems we might face. Um, a lot of alignment research is kind of trying to take today's AI systems and get them to behave as we want today, which isn't necessarily the same challenge as getting something that's kind of uh, smart enough to do its own research, to, behave, to consistently behave as humans want it to. Um, at the same time, I think a lot of other AI alignment agendas have a different problem, which is they're kind of trying to theorize about these very powerful systems that don't exist yet, and they're basically not producing anything in the way of like reality checks, uh, visible forward progress, things that outsiders can understand and skill up on and learn about. And so I think AI alignment research is in kind of tough shape right now. Um, I think there are some research agendas that don't have any of the problems I'm talking about. Um, there are some research agendas that I think are pointed at the hardest problems and are kind of moving forward in a legible way that other people can build on. Um, and I think working on one of those is great if you can swing it. And I think the other stuff, it just, it's still worth working on, but I think it has, it, it could be frustrating for different reasons. Um, and I think in general, if someone's gonna go into AI alignment research, uh, I think a lot of the important quality is being like incredibly interested in the topic um, and being ready for kind of just like a disorganized field without great mentorship and without clear goals and where everything is very fuzzy. And I think those, those skills and those kind of personality traits are probably more important than being like, you know, the absolute top technical talent in the world um, because I do think it's a, it's a very young embryonic field. So someone who kind of has a lot of vision for it, can deal with messy, poorly defined things, could add a lot of value. Um, and I think someone looking for like a lot of structure and scaffolding is gonna have trouble. And that might change in the future. Um, so that's, that's a general category, AI alignment research. Um, other things I think that can help, I think, um, in general, I think I expect that governments eventually will be playing a very large role uh, in how things happen with advanced AI systems whenever that happens. And I think it could be soon, it could be a long way away, it's very hard to know. Um, and I think it would be great if there were maximal kind of people in and around government giving advice, helping it handle these situations who are kind of uh, focused on problems that could matter for the big picture. So I think a thing that, you know, an example of a thing that I think is very likely to happen is that as AI systems get more and more impressive capabilities, the default reaction of a lot of people in government is gonna say, let's race ahead with this stuff so that we can get it before other countries do. Having the kind of people around who can also like recognize the argument for the other side, even when the two, weighing the two against each other is hard, um, you know, can kind of understand why we might worry about AI taking on all of humanity, which is not necessarily a simple thing to understand. Um, people who are thoughtful about how to make those trade-offs, I think could be huge. And so I think one thing I would suggest for people interested in this topic who wanna help would be going into government. Um, I don't know that it's essential to be working on AI off the bat. I think just working on technology, learning a lot, advancing, um, and like being a person who just like generally understands a lot how things work in government and understands a lot about AI and is positioned as the demand grows to give better and better advice, um, I think could be really good. 
Another area that I uh, wish I saw more people going into is information security. Uh, this is something that a couple of Open Philanthropy staff, uh, Luke Mühlhauser and Claire Zabel, wrote about a while ago. Um, I think this just like consistently doesn't get enough attention. Um, so basically, you know, you're working at an AI company or maybe at a government project at some point, and you're building these very powerful systems. And I think by default, it's going to be a huge threat um, that someone steals them. Um, and I think that makes the situation look pretty bad if what you're trying to do is be cautious and careful and only deploy AI, deploy AI systems that you're very confident are safe and are not going to want to not, not going to sort of have these goals of their own that are um, incompatible with humanity. It's really bad if you then have just like lots of people or lots of governments able to just steal what you're working on and deploy it themselves. Um, I think there's other reasons security. Uh, can be a major issue, like the AI systems themselves, as uh, if you kind of mess them up and they do end up with these bad goals, you kind of want that to not immediately result in a security breach um, by the AI system. You kind of don't want a world where an AI system can just like hack its way to sort of whatever it's trying to do. Um, and at some point, we may need AI systems helping with security. Um, but I think just having lots of people who understand security um, and are good at making systems both more practical and more secure could be incredibly important. Um, I think in general in the tech industry, people who work on security are just kind of over demanded and under supplied and security tends to just not be that good. Uh, this is something I would like really love to see change and I think people going into careers in security, I think it's kind of a good career generally just on a personal level um, because of it being over demanded and under supplied so I think it could be quite valuable. Um, other things I think are valuable. Uh, there's a whole category of like growing and empowering the set of people who cares about these issues in the first place. Uh, this conference is certainly relevant to that. There's a whole kind of category of organizations working on effective altruist community growth, uh, maybe long-termist community growth, maybe community growth of others who care about issues like this. Um, there's a lot of activity now. I think there's an increasing number of jobs and opportunities and grant programs that you can explore. I think it's an area, again, it's a little bit disorganized. It's not the area we're going to get incredible mentorship and a lot of clear steps to take, but I think it is an interesting area. Um, and it also, I think, a related idea would be, uh, I think it could be helpful for people to kind of spread and normalize and communicate uh, important ideas about the risks we're facing as humanity. So just, you know, the very idea that, uh, that AI systems could end up with goals of their own and be dangerous to everyone, I think it's very unintuitive, very hard to understand. The more people understand that idea, can engage with it, um, maybe it's wrong, so then can shoot it down, I think is better. And so I think, you know, for things like that and, and many other ideas that I think are important but maybe, maybe not widely appreciated, uh, I think going to journalism can be good. I even imagine uh, you know, writing fiction could be good to, to kind of communicate and normalize certain things to certain people. Um, I think other, other areas that I, uh, that I wish there were more people in, I mean, I think there's just a lot of confusing, disorienting questions about the situation we're in and about the, the very question itself of what actions are most helpful. So I wrote an EA forum post called Important Actionable Research Questions for the Most Important Century. It's another area where it's hard to work on these productively. There's not a lot of great structure and mentorship, but anyone who thinks that they could make progress on them, I think that would be great. Um, and then I think some stuff that's not so directly about AI. Um, I also think, although I haven't gone into it as much in this talk, but I also think that pandemic risk is a big deal. Uh, I think we are not currently very good at handling it. I think that people who go into, you know, for example, jobs researching better preventative and countermeasures for pandemics could be great. Um, there's a blog post that I like by uh, uh, Open Philanthropy employee Andrew Snyder Beattie uh, called Concrete Biosecurity Projects, some of which could be big. And I think that has some guidelines for like where one might aim with one's career. Um, things like developing better personal protective equipment, sterilization technology to just kind of kill microorganisms all over the environment. Um, and then I think there's, there's, you know, another category of things people can do that I just, I generally feel that people who have the opportunity to just do impressive things that solve important problems in the world um, are going to end up in a position to be helpful um, with AI or other things, where what, whatever happens, um, because I think doing anything really well and really impressively can open a lot of doors. Um, so I, I often say, you know, any anything you can do where like 
people, you know, let's, let's say you're identified as an effective altruist. Anything you can do that other effective altruists will kind of brag about you um, and want to, want to be associated with the work you did, that's not just AI work. That could be work on education, on inequality, on global poverty, on COVID-19, on climate change, um, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, a related idea to that is that I, I do suspect that people interested in effective altruism often have kind of a talent or an aptitude for critically reviewing evidence, for reasoning about uncertain uh, questions. And so I think people just kind of working on areas related to forecasting, making predictions, going through academic literature, making arguments about what is true in an uncertain world. Um, I think if there were a lot, of, a lot of people like that, I think that that would be very good. And I think that um, we would maybe be in a world where, where people are kind of used to listening to people who reason that way on important topics. And if we had more people who are good at reasoning on uncertain important topics, hopefully we'll get just like in a better and better position to have clarity about how to think about some of these really hard questions with AI. Um, so those are ideas of like where one's career might end up that I think could be really helpful. Um, but I do want to be clear that when I think about careers and especially early careers, I am pretty resistant to the frame of like writing down what activity would be most helpful and trying to immediately jump into doing that activity. I think especially early in your career, probably the most important thing you can be doing is just kind of getting better at stuff, um, becoming more the kind of person you want to be, building skills, building what I call aptitudes. Um, and I do generally think that you know, when you're early in your career, I think a lot of the best heuristic is to kind of look at your opportunities and take the ones where you think you're going to grow a lot. You're going to be surrounded by great people. You're going to be doing something that you're good at and going to be getting maybe better at. Um, I think excitement, being able to imagine yourself putting a ton of hours into something is probably a good thing. It's not like determinative. I don't think people should just do whatever they're most excited about. But I think it's like an important thing to listen to. Um, most people who come to me for career advice are choosing between like two perfectly fine things that are that seem like either one could be higher impact than the other, and they really want to talk about like the calculations, which one is higher impact, and I usually just think they should do whichever one they're more excited about um, and think they're going to be more in their element, growing more, learning more, working more. Um, so because I think that the the signal you get from your excitement and your feeling that you can really get into something and picture yourself being good at something is probably like more informative than whatever calculations someone is doing about what's going to be the highest impact activity. Uh, very broadly speaking, the future is just like very hard to predict. We're probably going to need a lot of skills and a lot of activities that we don't know we need right now. Um, and so in some ways, I think uh, an underrated option for effective altruists who want to be helpful is to just be really good at something, anything. Um, and be ready to switch what you're doing, to be kind of, you know, keeping, and I think this gets a lot harder as you advance in your career, um, but someone who can be in a career where they're, they're great at something, but they also have the kind of the reserves, the financial reserves, the emotional reserves, the general state, and the preparedness that, like, as the world changes and there are more needs, that they would be able to move jobs. Um, I think that is like actually maybe an incredibly high impact thing to be doing. It's kind of like a high expected value lottery ticket. Um, I think most people right now would kind of have trouble feeling that they were doing something great if that's what they were doing, but it seems to me that they would be. Um, so I think that's, that's one uh, final interesting option. And with that in mind, I do, I do tend to encourage people to think a lot about what kind of jobs they think they could be great at, be excited about, thrive in. Uh, and so I think that has to be balanced in there. So that is uh, all, of my, all of my discussion of the, my trajectory through effective altruism, the most important century, and how I think people can help. And I'm going to spend the rest of the time taking questions. Great. Thanks so much, Holden. I guess we'll take a seat. Yep. Um, yeah, so a lot to dive into there. So I'll start with a couple of my questions, um, and I'll also be tracking the audience questions and aim to ask the most popular ones. Um, so again, to, open, to ask questions, open your swap card app, click in the session, click on the questions tab, and submit your question there. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll start us off with uh, your kind of area of expertise, what, what Open Philanthropy is doing. So what, what is Open Philanthropy doing to support people in doing things 
doing the things that you wish people were doing? Yeah, open philanthropy um, does a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I increasingly am focused on the long-term side of open philanthropy. So Alexander Berger runs a lot of our work now. Um, the three main areas that I oversee at Open Philanthropy are um, AI safety, um, bio risk, and bio risk reduction rather, and uh, and EA community growth. So that would be like you know helping to grow the set of people who are interested in doing as much good as possible, especially from a long term perspective. Um, EA community growth has just like a large number of programs by now, just things that people can apply for um, to get early career funding so that they can explore effective altruism careers and explore effective altruism ideas. Um, so that's a lot of what they do. It's not all of what they do. We also support organizations like 80,000 Hours and Center for Effective Altruism. Um, you know, BioRisk, I mean, just has, has a, a lot of different activities they do. Uh, they support a lot of the core kind of biosecurity and pandemic preparedness organizations in the US, like the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins. Um, they also you know, do kind of funding of research and development for countermeasures to particularly threatening um, you know, potential for pandemics. Um, and so uh, and they, you can read more about what they do in this, in this kind of concrete biosecurity project, some of which could be big, post on the Effective Altruism Forum. And then um, our AI work, I mean, we, we support a bunch of policy analysis and programs for people who want to work on careers in government or careers doing um, you know, policy advice on how to handle AI. And then we also support a bunch of technical research on AI alignment. Um, so organizations like Redwood Research we support. So those are, those are examples of things we do. Um, great, so that's, that's a, a nice comprehensive overview of the grant making side. Um, mm -hmm. What about on the kind of staff side, on the hiring side? Do you have hiring plans to, to support this work? Yeah, the, um, the Open Phil EA community growth team has been actively hiring for a while, mm -hmm. and they're looking to roughly double in size. There are about four people right now, but they've just had a, a couple of offers accepted and have a couple more out. Um, so that is the team that is hiring the most actively, although after this round, they're probably going to take a pause, see how things go for a while, and then maybe do another hiring round. Um, the other teams are not growing very fast. I think like in, in those areas, we, uh, we sort of feel that there's a lot of the top grants we want to make, we've kind of made. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of what we're doing is trying to get a better strategy, work on some of these things called worldview investigations at Open Philanthropy that try to get us have a better handle on which activities would be most helpful. Mm -hmm. And those can help us design grant making programs. So because of that, uh, a lot of what we do is, is figuring out what we most want to fund, mm -hmm. what we most want to push. Um, that work can is, is not easy to scale very fast. So I think our hiring there is like not, yeah, not as active. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, becoming co-CEOs with Alexander. Yep. Um, could you talk a bit, a bit more about that and how has that arrangement been working on the global health and well-being side? Yeah, sure. Um, Alexander Berger is, um, he, he came to Open Philanthropy, I mean, he came to GiveWell, I think it was in 2012, when we were in New York and there was like five of us. Um, it was his first job and, uh, you know, he's just been amazing from the start. I think one of the, one of the first things he did was found like a, a something, some massive, uh, mistake in one of the reports we were using to uh, to estimate cost effectiveness for deworming, um, and he's just grown in responsibility really fast. And uh, you know, we just got to a point where I felt two things. One is I felt that I wanted to focus more on long-term causes. I felt that we really needed to put more time into strategically clarifying what we're trying to do, more time into writing up weird things that we believe so that people understand more where we're coming from and can critique them. So stuff like the most important century series I wrote um, and just felt, felt that I was not giving especially AI risk, enough attention with the role that I had overseeing everything that Open Philanthropy is doing. And the other thing I felt was that Alexander uh, was just doing amazing and was already overseeing a lot of that work anyway um, and was increasingly the right person to oversee it. So it was, uh, it was my idea to have this uh, promotion for him for us to become co-CEOs. And it was in the works for a while. Um, and yeah, I'm happy with it. I mean, I think he's been doing a great job. I, I'm getting less involved every day in that stuff. And I, I don't really have any regrets about it so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, and you, you mentioned the, the post you wrote in February, important actionable research questions for the most important century. And in there, you list a bunch of things that you wish people would start working on. Um, has anyone uh, started that kind of work? 
I have gotten just like emails and seen blog posts that people are just like, hey, I'm, I'm trying to work on this question now. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to do that or, you know, or I'm just trying to scope on AI alignment. So I've seen them. I mean, I'm not, I haven't systematically surveyed or anything like that because mm -hmm. a lot of the goal of that post was more to get clarity for myself and, and for our team um, about what we're trying to do, what the most important questions are. But yeah, I, I, have, I have seen the examples. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think you, you covered this sort of somewhat in the talk, but um, you're kind of, Post about this time last year, my current impressions on career choices for long termists. Yeah. Um, yeah. Has anything majorly changed since then? I wouldn't say so. I mean, if I wrote it today, it might be like a little bit different. There's a, there's a post called My Current Impressions on Career Choice for Long Termists where I kind of talk about what I think someone's career you know, goals and decisions should be, especially early in their career, mm -hmm. when a lot of the goal is to just get better at stuff. Um, rather than to dive in and, and immediately do the most important thing in the world. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I mostly stand by it. So, um, you know, my current take on careers is that I, I definitely have a list of stuff I wish people were doing. Um, and if someone's already ready to do that stuff, that's great. And they should like, according to me, do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that uh, for most people, especially early in their career, the post I made, you know, over a year ago is like more representative of the main stuff I think people should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. And you spoke to um, aptitudes that you wish people uh, would, would develop. What's kind of a common mistake you see people making early in their careers? Yeah, a common early career mistakes. I mean, I think one of them is like, really focusing on how much impact you're going to have on like day one of your job or something. Um, you know, I generally think of a career as you're going to spend a while just building aptitudes and getting better at something and probably like years, you know, 10 to 10 to 40 of your career or whatever um, are going to be like so much higher impact um, than years one to 10 that I, I don't think that even really caring how much impact you have is a good idea in years one to 10. Yeah. Uh, and I, I largely, in my career, like the early decisions I made, I just like wasn't even trying to have a positive impact on the world. I was mm -hmm. trying to do stuff I found interesting or I would learn. Um, I think that's the right call. So I think, I think that's a common mistake. Um, I think people like often see themselves as like more adaptable, flexible, generic than they really are. So I do wonder if just being in college, you get used to the idea that you can you can do things well with a few hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get to a career, if you want to be the best in the world at what you're doing, or you even want to just be as good as you can be, um, that's just like, we're talking about like years at working probably more than 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a very different thing. And so I think most people, there are things, there are jobs they can really thrive in and work really hard at and really be good at. And then there are jobs where they'll be like dragging themselves through it because they think they should be able to do it. And like, that's a really important distinction. I really think most people should care a lot about getting the first kind of job uh, rather than just kind of assuming or imagining that they would be equally good at anything they tried. So they should just pick the, you know, the thing that the numbers say to do. Mm -hmm. So you didn't make that mistake in your career, but are there any things that you would do differently if you got like a do-over? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I would, well, I probably would literally do nothing differently because I think I had pretty good luck. And so mm -hmm. I just like wouldn't want to mess with it. Um, I think if I were to do things that I thought were kind of like smarter ex ante, like mm -hmm. make more sense from the beginning. Um, you know, I mean, I probably would have just learned more math and ML and stuff really early, mm -hmm. um, mostly because I think most things in life are best learned on the job. Mm -hmm. And those things are not. Those things are really like, you can learn them in school. You can learn them by taking a class. Um, so I think I would just have like more skills generally um, mm -hmm. if I had studied like math or ML or even like physics uh, rather than like social theory in college. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was sort of a mistake, although also it just left me like probably I would have had to like spend less time doing other fun stuff in college. So I don't really know. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, but I, 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 um, I think that could have made me better at, at a wide variety of things. Like I don't, I don't really wish that I had like specialized super hard because I'm, I'm glad for all the things I've been able to do and mm -hmm. glad that I've been, um, you know, started GiveWell, uh, co-founded GiveWell and all the work that's being done on, on non-long-term causes I'm really happy about. So I like, yeah, I don't regret, for example, doing that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, yeah I also wouldn't mess with the trajectory. So, um, what are important qualities you think uh, everybody should try to cultivate if they're doing long-term work or I guess EA work in general? 
Yeah, um, I think, well, I think the answers are different. I mean, I think long-termist work has the particular quality. It's, it's hard. I think it's hard and frustrating work. Mm -hmm. It has the particular quality that it's very hard to know if something you're doing is being helpful. Um, and there's just generally a lack of like clarity around what would be helpful and therefore a lack of structure and mentorship. Um, so I really think that like if, if you want to work at a long-termist area and you want to do long-termist stuff all day, you should really be ready to just like every few weeks just be like, I think what I'm doing is doing harm. Um, mm -hmm. Or I don't know if what I'm doing is good at all. Or gosh, like I was working on this project, but I don't think this project makes any sense. And you should just like be ready to have that thought just like constantly. I think for some people that's just incredibly demoralizing and exhausting and it's like, actually they should not be in that career and they should go do something else. Um, I think in other areas, there's like a lot more tangible, straight line forward, like you know what you need to do to help people and you can do it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's really something to be said for that. There's a lot of super valuable work that looks more like that. It doesn't tend to look that way in long-termism. And I would encourage people to kind of maybe not go into long-termism um, if what they want is that kind of work. And then you can go in other areas and you know, you're still able to switch around later as things become more clear. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in your experience, what's a, what's a sort of chronically undervalued skill in your view? Chronically undervalued skill. Um, I mean, in general, a thing that we see a lot of at open philanthropy, it's this really important quality that causes people to do well or poorly, but is not like often talked about is what we call ownership. Um, so ownership is, is this feeling that you're working on a project and it's just like, it's just on you if it goes well. It's, it's you, it's up to you, and it's your fault if it doesn't go well. Um, and I think that's just like a hard, a hard mentality for many people to have. So mm -hmm. an example of what I mean is that you're, you know, you're at Open Philanthropy and your manager says, here, you should do A, B, and C, and that will like, get us an answer to this question. And then you do A, B, and C, and as you're doing them, you kind of realize that like, your manager was kind of, like they didn't really have a good picture of what was going on because they were, you're closer to the work than they are. So you're like doing the work and you're like, oh, the manager wanted me to do B, but I really, I really should be doing like B prime instead because um, B is not actually going to give us a good answer to this question. Um, and then there's like a fork in the road. So do you do, I think some people would do A, B, and C, come back to their manager, be like, here's my answer. And the manager would be like, oh, I don't think this answer ended up being that compelling. And the person would be like, well, I did what you told me to. So that's like, that's like path one. And path two would be the person is like actually going back to their manager and arguing with them mm -hmm. and saying, no, like, you told me to do A, B, and C, B is not working. Like, B is not a good idea. We need to do something different. Um, that's hard. Like, it's hard to be, like, pushing back on your manager. It's hard to be challenging the premise of the assignment. And I think the mentality that often generates that behavior is when the person says, you know, like, it's just not my manager's job for this to go well. It's really my job. I'm trying to get help from them, but it's really my job. Um, and if it goes poorly, it's really my fault. And um, I think that's just a mentality that... Uh, you know, people, I think different people, some, some people can take ownership over some kinds of things and not other things. Um, and I think work is just dramatically better uh, when it's done by people who feel ownership, that just, just feel like they have the power and the responsibility mm -hmm. uh, for everything to go well, not just to do what they were told. Yeah, I think there's a concept, I think actually maybe I read it from something you wrote, which is direct, directly responsible individuals. And this concept, if you can get people to get that, like the buck really stops at you. It's your yep. job to get to the right answer. It's super yeah, valuable, exactly. but very yeah. hard to get there. Yeah, And it's especially hard in a, in a context where let's say someone is new mm -hmm. and their manager is way more experienced and has power. Um, it, could, it can be very hard to kind of, you know, have that vulnerability to mm -hmm. say, hey, this isn't going well, or I don't agree with you. Um, so I think this is not like, this is so much easier said than done. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think in the end that just having this intense feeling that something is up to you uh, is like really valuable and, and it, can be, it can be hard to pull off. Yeah. Um, okay, some questions from the audience. Uh, so you mentioned that you don't fully subscribe to the argument that, um, that you know, AI is the most important thing, but it's not the only thing we should be focusing on. And can you say a bit more about your kind of mental models and, of course, prioritization and how you think we could cut, we should, we, society, EA, should balance uh, the needs of uh, long-termist work and non-long-termist work? Sure. I mean, I think, I think if the whole EA community just decided we're all going to work on AI risk, that's the only thing that matters, everything else doesn't matter. Um, if we decided that, that would just be bad in like a lot, a lot, a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think they range from... I think philosophically, I think that the kind of 
the arguments that generate the idea that the long run future is so much more important than everything else are interesting arguments. Um, I don't think they're like strong enough um, or that philosophy in general is like a strong enough methodology um, that it makes sense to ultimately like completely ignore a lot of tangible, solvable uh, problems in the world to just put everything you can into these kind of theoretical things that affect the very long run future. Um, I think there's like, like I think for example, for me to be kind of trying to do a, a responsible transition of a lot of the work I've done to other people who can do it even better um, is like a reasonable thing to be doing. And for me to be focusing on AI, given that I think it's a good match for their skills, is like a reasonable thing to be doing. Mm -hmm. But I think if like the whole EA community went in on AI, it'd just be like, there'd be very many unreasonable things we were doing. Uh, there'd be many just facially kind of big problems in the world that we have big opportunities to solve. And instead, we're kind of trying to uh, make very marginal interventions on a very uncertain cause. Um, so I think A just like, I don't think the philosophical arguments are like vetted enough, strong enough, solid enough to just justify that behavior at a most intuitive level. I think we should be like very confused about ethics. Um, I think any ethics you come up with that tries to be totally fair and impartial and that says the long run future is so important, those ethics are also gonna have lots of problems with them. For example, you know how they handle infinities and things like that. Um, and so I think we should just generally approach ethics with a spirit of humility, uncertainty. Um, I personally think the right school of approach to moral uncertainty, like being uncertain which ethical system is best, um, is closer to like a moral parliament system. And so um, what that means is there's, this is a little bit of a digression or in the weeds, but uh, when, you're, when you're uncertain which system of ethics is the one you should follow, um, some people would say you should kind of do something that's sort of like calculating the expected value. So like if there's a system of ethics that might be 10% right, likely to be the best one, but it's like claims that the things you're doing are 100 times as important, you should do that. Um, and then there's another school of handling this that says you should do something more like if I'm 50-50 if I'm on different schools of ethics, I should maybe put 50% of my resources behind each. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm, I'm more a subscriber to that second one, at least at the level of like communities and mega philanthropists. I do think individuals should work on one thing because specialization division of labor is good. So I'm talking right now about why I don't want the whole EA community to go on on one thing. So that's like the moral thing. I've been pretty vague on that. It's something I hope to write about more in the future. The main thing I'm saying is I just like don't buy the hardcore ethical utilitarian arguments that uh, some things matter so much more than others to the point where I think we can just be confident in them. Um, I think other stuff is just like a lot, a lot of obvious bad stuff would happen. I think we would just lose the opportunity to have a variety of people accomplishing a variety of things, building a variety of skills, having a variety of accomplishments. And I think that's important because even the future of AI and what we're gonna need for AI is extremely uncertain. My views on what kind of skills are needed has changed dramatically over the last few years and I expect to continue changing. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think, I think generally just this community, I think would become a much more unhealthy place because everyone would be trying to enter into some area that might not be a good fit for them. Um, and I think you would get a lot of pathologies out of that. In fact, I think we may already be getting some pathologies out of that. Um, so yeah, I don't uh, basically think that, I, I don't think the whole EA community should be all in on one cause. I don't think open philanthropy should be all in on one cause. I think most individuals should be all in on one cause because mm -hmm. it's good to specialize, but that's different from believing that cause is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. And when you said you, you've changed your mind a, a bunch on, on what you think uh, what you think is important even within that field and AI field, is that things like is that the kind of things that, that you mentioned like uh, security and um, other other things? Mostly, I mean, it's also just the case that a lot of times some organization that I think is doing good work just needs to hire like someone with kind of normal skills. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, like a lawyer, um, you know, <laughs> a, a, a PR communications person, and it's just like. Yeah, I, I, I think it's like a little hard to anticipate stuff, even at that kind of like very basic, unsexy level. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we just had like, if every person ever was interested in effective altruism was just trying to do like technical alignment research, mm -hmm. we would just like bump into a lot of problems with stuff like that. So I think that's that's kind of a more mundane version of, of the issue. But yeah, I, I, I definitely, I mean, my take on the value of government careers, the value of communications related careers, the value of information security, those have all, you know, gone up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people people used to talk about 
the a AI and the AI alignment problem as if it's like basically a math problem. Mm -hmm. um, we basically need people working on alignment research. That's basically what we need. That's it. We're either going to solve the problem or we won't. Uh, I think people sometimes do talk about it that way. Used to even more talk about it that way. And my, my picture of the problem is like pretty multidimensional and requires a lot of people with a lot of skills. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about uh, your views on uh, sort of stagnation of technolo technological innovation, um, do you think the continued progress of AI makes the rate of other uh, tech progress unimportant, or yeah, what are, your, what are your views in this space? Well, everything is very uncertain. So I think you know, even even in my most important century series, I say I think there's a better than even odds chance that we're looking at transformative AI within this century by 2100. But like, not 90 percent or anything. Um, I think it's just very hard to know these things. So. Um, I think that technological progress, by default, I think in most cases across most fronts, is a good thing for humanity. And I think uh, trying to bring it forward, I think, helps a lot of people by default. Um, there are some areas that I think are like maybe more bad than good. Um, it's a judgment call, which of those you believe in. Um, so I think, I think in general, like work on technological progress is often a good way to help people. But I wouldn't say always. Mm -hmm. um so another sort of different kind of area. So how aligned do you think kind of EA prestige is, is with the thing, the work that is really, really useful? Or are there other kind of areas that you wish had more kind of uh, prestige in the community? Sure. Um, I think it's probably, I feel like pretty reasonable about like some sort of uh, rank ordering of the top few things or something. Like mm -hmm. I, I tend... I tend to mostly agree with like EA conventional wisdom on like mm -hmm. what the few most important valuable things to do are if you can be good at them. Um, I think where some disagreements come in are I'm like, I don't think everyone should be trying to force themselves into those top things. Um, and I think there is a lot of unpredictability and there's a lot to be said for people just taking jobs where they can thrive and grow. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for this vision I outlined of just like, you do something really well, and it's not what everyone else is doing really well, and you're ready to change jobs. That mm -hmm. seems to have like high ex ante expected value. Um, so, yeah, I think I think I feel I feel mostly okay about it. I think I think I do have like some you know some places where I feel a little out of alignment with the conventional wisdom. I'll just give one example. Like, I think um, people will often talk about doing AI policy as a very important thing, and I'm like a little unsure exactly what that means, but. Um, I think it's really hard right now to be coming up with good policy advice for governments. And a lot of the people I think want to be doing that should maybe be just like in general getting into government and getting to know government. Um, because I think that field is just so embryonic that a lot of people who try to help are not necessarily getting a lot of opportunities to learn a lot or be helpful. So I think I'm, I'm skeptical of some of the career paths that are like referred to as AI policy. Um, I'm skeptical of people like really focusing on like advocacy or for specific policies targeted AI, because we just don't have a lot of clarity around that. Um, there are some opportunities I think are good, but I don't know that I'd be, I feel like some, some th that career track gets a lot of attention that I'm, I'm not sure everyone looking at it should be. Um, mm -hmm. And like a counterpoint would be the security thing where I just like, yeah, I guess I feel like if I like magically controlled the way that EA conventional wisdom works, people would just like kind of never shut up about security. It would just, mm -hmm. it would be one of those top few things. Um. When thinking about uh, the growth of people working on um, sort of EA courses and long termist courses, uh, are there other things you're particularly excited about? Are you, you know, are you pro the kind of high fidelity stuff growing and the low fidelity stuff growing, but broad outreach, narrow outreach? What's high fidelity and low fidelity? I guess maybe it's something like uh, lots of EA. I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting the question, um, and so I'm, I'm guessing it's things like. Uh, just like lots of materials online and then things like more intensive groups and programs and retreats and things. Yeah, I mean, I'm, a, I'm excited about a lot of stuff happening right now, just generally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm excited about a lot of the alignment research I'm seeing. I think there's more and more good AI alignment research. I'm excited a lot of, a lot of the EA community growth stuff I'm seeing, a lot mm -hmm. of the campus groups, um, a lot of the like online courses, virtual mm -hmm. programs that are just helping to spread what I think are very important ideas that people should be thinking about and understanding more. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about various biosecurity things, uh, just that projects that are in motion, grantees we might pick up that are trying to get ahead of the next pandemic, whether it's something like COVID or something much worse. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's, there's lots of exciting stuff happening. Yeah. Um, and then 
yeah, I guess, could you outline, I think you kind of go into this, you've already kind of stated your odds on uh, timelines, but what are your kind of odds? Like Toby's put his odds out there of like surviving this century. Yeah. Um, have you, have you written that down anywhere, and, and what are your thoughts? These are, these are hard to put numbers on, and I tend mm -hmm. to give ranges, partly because my numbers move around a lot, and mm -hmm. I don't want to be like having all these like public numbers that might be out of date in a week. Mm -hmm. um, things, things that I often say in public that are, that are bounds, that are not like my full views, um, but I've, I've believed these things like consistently for a long time. Mm -hmm. One is, you know, I think transformative AI this century, before 2100, is like more likely than not. Um, Two, I th you know, uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to talk about my media, and that might that might be moving around. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I don't know. I'm I'm happy to say like, it it seems to me even like it's even like it's at least even odds for like by 2060 or something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then I would say it's at least 10 percent odds that we're going to have this crazy transformative AI by 2036. Um, mm -hmm. That's just the year that I started saying this in 2016. I started saying 10% chance within 20 years. So I haven't wanted to move the goalposts. And now we're talking about 14 years. And I still think it's at least 10%. Um, so those are, those are some things I think. What about doom? I mean, gosh, that's, that's just to, 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 to reason about whether we're going to get a good outcome or a bad one. I mean, there's so many things, ways things could go poorly, so many ways things could go well. I have an upcoming series of posts trying to explore them. Um, a thing I sometimes say about the odds of uh, AI having its own goals and disempowering all of humanity is I, I say I think it's between 10 and 90 percent and I think that actually narrows the range a ton because um, I think there's a lot of people who are way outside of that range there's a lot of 99 percenters walking around who think that we're just doomed and we're you know trying to have death with dignity or whatever um, I strongly disagree with that I have never understood where that confidence is coming from I do not think the underlying models make sense um, and I don't think we should be approaching the problem with that attitude. And then there's people who think that like the odds of AI trying to overpower humanity are like less than 1%. There's no way you could just train an AI system any way you want using today's methods. And no matter how powerful it gets, it'll just like do what you were hoping it would do. And I just also think that doesn't make sense and I don't agree with it. So between 10 and 90%, I've narrowed the range a lot. Yeah, <laughs> great. Um, so thinking about um, media, um, I guess a couple of questions. Like, do you, can you recommend any fiction that you think portrays a really positive vision of the long-term future? And then I guess a broader question about media and what you're excited to see. Like, there's the recent Kurtzkazak video that was out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what recent Kurtzkazak? The, the 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 video. Uh, yeah. There was like a YouTube video for okay. long-termism. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't think I'm the best person for this. I'm not a. I'm. I'm these days. I mean, I'm. I'm. A, you know, a co CEO and a dad, and I'm uh, <laughs> not consuming a lot of fiction, to be honest. Yeah. So I don't know that I have a ton to recommend. That I've been. Uh, I've written some on, on my blog about utopia and what a good long term future could look like. So that's my vision, mm -hmm. and I do link to a few uh, stories there. But I also say that I've been like kind of unhappy with like most utopian stuff I've tried to read. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we were talking about it in the office, and I think Star Trek is apparently one of the few uh, yeah. visions of a positive future. Yeah. And, I mean, Star Trek is awesome. So. It's kind of a nice vision, but they also spend almost the entire show just like like having conflict yeah. with people who are not from that vision. So uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's what we want our future to be. I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, you mentioned that you're a dad. Congrats, you've had, yeah, a, you've had a baby. Yeah. Um, yeah, could you talk a bit more about that? How has that been? Was that, yeah, yeah some clams for the baby. <laughs> um, how has that been? How has that impacted work? How has that impacted how you do sure. life? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, my wife, Danielle, and I uh, had a kid about a year ago. We just had his uh, first birthday party about a week ago on the mm -hmm. weekend. Um, and he had many, uh, many fans and admirers, and it was yeah. a great time. So he's about one year old, so I don't know if he's a baby anymore. I would call him a man. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no pressure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's great. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I think I don't have a lot of interesting things to say. I really enjoy being with my son, um, and it's been rewarding, and it's been also, yeah, like, difficult, and there's a lot of work that goes into it, and um, so, uh, yeah, I haven't... I think there was, some, there was someone who uh, put on, like, Effective Altruism Facebook somewhere that that they just like, they really loved being a parent, but it had not changed their worldview at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm in that camp. Uh, I, would, mm -hmm. I would say that I, uh, you know, I, 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 could, I could make some cute statement about how having a child has made me realize that I care about future generations, but I already cared about future generations. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it hasn't, hasn't really changed me intellectually in any particular way I can imagine, but I've been glad we did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Um, 
So to, yeah, switch back to AI, um, can you speak a bit more about which, uh, you mentioned there are some research agendas you're kind of more excited about. Uh, could you maybe talk a bit more about those? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think there's an increasing interest in interpretability. Um, you know, I know that the, um, the team at Anthropic, which, which uh, as a disclosure, my wife is co-founder of and president of, um, does, has been doing like very interesting work kind of trying to uh, understand mechanically how an AI system works. Um, and the, I, think, I think a lot of the idea, and I'm gonna be writing more about this very soon, um, but a lot of the idea here is that if you could, um, if you could kind of look inside an AI's digital brain and see what it's thinking and how it's reasoning, that could reduce a number of the risks we're worried about because a lot of the challenge of AI alignment is to build something that you know, might be kind of more capable than humans and might see a lot of things humans don't and so be able to fool humans. And, you want, and, and it's hard to train an AI system not to fool humans because anytime you are happy with what it did, it might be because it fooled you successfully. Mm -hmm. um, and so getting it to, you know, be able to look inside such a system's brain seems good. Um, I'm also interested in, like when I imagine, when I ask myself, like, so we had, we, we built something that could have destroyed all of humanity if it wanted to, but instead it just helped us out. How did we do that when I asked that? You know, um, some of my answer is we got lucky. Some of my answer is like maybe we were able to like read its mind, which is like the interpretability stuff. Some of my answer is maybe we were able to institute systems of checks and balances mm -hmm. where you have some AIs critiquing other AIs and kind of like, you know, the term debate has been used. You might have two AI systems taking different sides of a recommendation and between themselves, kind of like two lawyers in a courtroom, they surface everything that's going on for a human to think about and consider. Um, I think that general genre is like an interesting area. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think, I think that's kind of cool. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think the eliciting latent knowledge report for me was like a better communication of a lot of what's hard about AI alignment than I had previously seen. So if only for that reason, I kind of liked it. And I like, I like the method, all, like I, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm often not that excited about alignment theory work people are doing. Um, but I like the way that Alignment Research Center is doing this uh, theory work in this like very, they're really trying for a very iterative method where they're, they're always kind of trying to, if they can come up with a single example of where their idea won't work, they just move on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, I liked that report and I liked the general methodology and the general spirit of having just like very high ambitions for theory work and setting it up in a way that you're, you're getting new information every day. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, those are some examples. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you mentioned um, kind of you know population growth and the change that that's um, the yeah and that, how that links to the kind of rate of growth. Do you wish there was kind of more research in this area or in in the area of of population growth? I mean, mm -hmm. growth economics is what we surveyed and um, summarized and what and what I, was kind of part of the underpinning for the most important century piece and. Um, I do think there's, there's some debates in growth economics about like whether historical growth is really accelerating or whether you should think of historical economy as more like a sequence of different growth modes. So like you, you could look at the same world economy, the data is very uncertain, and you could kind of see like a smooth acceleration that if you project it forward means we get a singularity this century. Or you could see like, like one rate of growth then a new technology, agriculture, then another rate of growth, then a new tech, then a new like development, industrial revolution, then another rate of growth. And if you're thinking of it that way, kind of you kind of end up at a similar conclusion if you just mm -hmm. ask about, you know, well, when would we expect an exchange and what would that look like? Um, but I think there's interesting debates there to be had. And um, yeah, I do I do wish that a higher percentage of economics was asking questions about like what could really flip over the table. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, you know, maybe relatively speaking, a little less focus on like changes in tax policy that could move the growth rate from like 2.03% to 2.05% and a little bit more emphasis on like, well, if the growth rate right now is 2%, what could make it go to negative 10 or to uh, 100? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be cool. Um, I don't know that it's like at the very top of my list of things that need to be done. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of lessons learned, I guess, like from you and Open Philanthropy, uh, is there anything uh, that you, you would share as like, oh, we, we learned this lesson and this might be useful for people when they're thinking about their careers or their organizations? Kind of, a, kind of an open-ended topic. Mm. Um, lesson, yeah, lessons learned that are relevant to careers. I mean, the main thing is I just like, I, 
when I observe people who I think have very successful, impressive careers, I just see them like moving around a lot and just like trying different things, looking for a fit. And usually when things are really good, it's because there was some kind of click where they found something they had a lot of energy for and they could really think about with a lot, like just like put a lot of time into, stick with it, go through the bad parts. Anything you're trying to do that's really great, there's probably gonna be times that are just horrible and miserable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where a lot of my intuition comes from that people should listen to themselves when picking careers and should pay attention to that inner voice of like, how is this feeling? Am I engaged? Am I getting better? Um, and not just kind of like, well, I, I wrote down a calculation saying this thing would be good to do, so I'm doing it. Um, that is somewhere where that intuition comes from. Mm -hmm. People, people at Open Philanthropy, like the ones, the ones who have succeeded there. I mean, they just they've changed like jobs a lot, and and even like mm -hmm. within philanthrop Open Philanthropy, they've changed roles a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that definitely resonates with our hiring as well. When people want to have it all figured out at 22 and be yeah. having impact then, and like you look at careers of really impressive people, and maybe they only yeah. did their really impressive thing when they turned 30 or something. Yeah, exactly, and mm -hmm. often later. So yeah. 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 Um, great, so uh, to, to round us off, um, yep, feeling like pretty inspired and I think there are lots of like clear messages. Uh, if people leave this session with one takeaway, uh, what do you think it should be? Huh. Uh, I kind of want to make it two contrasting takeaways, so I kind of mm -hmm. want to say one, um, geez, we could be in the most important century, this is not getting enough attention, it is not getting enough effort, we really need to do something, mm -hmm. um, and, and B, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think people should force themselves into a career or way of being that's not working for them because of a theoretical argument. So I think it's, it's navigating that tension that I, th I, I want more people to be aware of and, and even kind of agitated about um, some of the huge events that could be coming our way that aren't getting much attention. And I also want people to kind of listen to themselves and not feel that they need to go solve that whole problem right now, but they should be aware of it and they should have it on their radar. Awesome, great. Uh, thank you so much, Holden. Please join me in thanking Holden. Thank you. <laughs> All right.